and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand oh my god you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power what do you mean sitting at the right hand of power that's psalm 110 that is psalm 110 but said psalm 110 you said the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand so it means that the lord in psalm 110 is the same as the power but what does it mean the power the power is an evasive way of saying God without saying God. Just as we say today, Baruch Hashem, blessed be the name. Then in Hebrew, it's also Baruch Hagivora, the power. So the power is another way of saying yod heh What we call today is Hashem Adonai. You could also say the power. Another term is the place, Hamakom, the place. All of that is speaking about God itself. I want you to get that. So Messiah said, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. That's what he's saying, right? And coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, you've got to know your scriptures. He's making a cash with Daniel. So he's combining Daniel 7, the son of man, coming in the clouds with Psalm 110. He's bringing that together. And he's saying, if you can receive this beyond your absurdity, I am the son of man, the son of David, the son of God. And look at the high priest's response, verse 63. Tearing his clothes. Why would he tear his clothes? Why would the high priest tear his clothes when it's written in the Torah, don't tear your garment? Why the high priest tear his clothes? Because this revelation, this word that the Messiah spoke, is like it tore up the whole Torah in the high priest's mind. This was blasphemy. This was against his understanding of the Torah. He tore his clothes because it was an absurdity that this man standing in front of me is seated. We will see him at the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. This man, this, this is ah, outrageous. And you see the same response today, right? Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have our witnesses? And you have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemn him to be deserving of death. Why did they condemn him? Because he's saying that he's the Messiah? More than that, they understood that he was saved, that he is divine, he is deity, he is God, very God, the son of the blessed one. And the son is not a lesser God. It is the son proceeding from God. The angels didn't proceed from God, but the son proceeds from God. He's in the bosom of the father. And he understood what he was saying, but that didn't fit with his theology. So tear your clothes. What really should be happening was tearing the veil of his resistance so that the Messiah could come through. God is showing us something. And many times we have to tear the veil to let him in. Because we put up this barrier. It cannot be so. But with God, nothing is impossible, right? He can do anything anywhere with anyone. So I want us to see, I'm making this point again and again to us. And I want us to see that this one, you know, we have the scripture in, in Philippians 2 that says, uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is Lord to the glory of the Father. God the Father. And many people go say, Yeshua is Lord. Yeshua is Lord. Do you understand what that means? That is a text quoted out of Isaiah 45. And if you go back to that, the context of Isaiah 45 is yod heh vav speaking. So yod heh vav saying that every knee will bow to me and every tongue will swear allegiance that I am who I say that I am. And then he tells us that Messiah is that. So in other words, the, the, the Lord, the capital l Hashem of Isaiah 45 is yod heh vav -he in Philippians. So this is a high Christology. This is what's happening here. This is, this is Christocentric theology. This is showing that this one, the Christ, he is the Messiah God. He is Messiah God. And that's what Philippians is bringing home to us. That Yeshua, who Adonai, he is Lord. I and my father are one. He is Adonai. And let me show you something else. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8. Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I wanted to see something because you see, when you read the writings of Paul, I want you to see this Rabbi Shaul. So you read him as a Christian apostle and you, you jettison his Jewish. It's not so. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews. And I am a Pharisee, not was a Pharisee. He continued teaching in rabbinic style, and he wants us to understand that. But if we don't know the scriptures, we do greatly err too. But look with me at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. I want you to see this. But before you go there, 
Well, let me read it first, and then we'll see. I will mention something. So, First Corinthians eight verse six. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him. And one Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. Now you read that, and you say, okay, for us there is one God, and for us there is one Lord. But do you understand what Rabbi Shaul just told you there? This is a rabbi quoting this text. What do you think he's thinking behind his mind when he gives you this text? If you know the Torah, you will know what he is thinking. You will know that he's thinking. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He's using that word one, Echad. Move from English, go beyond Greek, and go back to the Hebrew. He's speaking and thinking about the Shema. So what he's saying, if you could receive it, if, if I, by, by God's grace, tear the veil of your understanding, he is saying that the Lord, here, O Israel, the Lord is our God. Well, the Lord there is Yeshua. And the God in the Shema is God the Father. So read it again. Yeshua, our Father. What does it mean? I and my Father are one. Yeshua is one with the Father. I and my father are one. And so you, will, you receive this and you begin to understand what God Almighty is saying to us. There's a quote from Dr. God that I would like to give to us. He says this, far from being the solitary individual envisioned by most people, the God of the Bible is actually a family, a community of three in one. God is one, being of spirit, substance, manifest in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, being co-equal, consubstantial, co-eternal. These three dwell together in mutual encircling and interpenetration. Without the principles of the family and community, God does not exist. So you've got to see this perfect unity. You've got to see how they are all together. There's a unity. And this is what God is bringing us into. And this is what is an absurdity for some Jewish people today. It, his, his deity is an absurdity. For most Jews today, his Jewishness, the son of David, is an absurdity for most Christian believers today. And I ask, who is behind that? Oh, my God. So I want, I'm laboring to make this point to us because I want to see by God's grace that you have to receive. Do you know who you believe? Yeshua, the Messiah. He is Lord. Do you understand what Lord means? He's not a lesser God. He is God, very God. He proceeds from God. I and the Father are one. There is distinction, but there is unity in the Godhead. He submits to his Father, but he's one with the Father. Are you understanding this? Or if not, just, just say yea and amen. Because we don't have to fully comprehend. We have to apprehend. And we have to make these truthful statements about who our God is. And so he is the Messiah God. The son of the living God. And I say to us again and again, because you go, you got to go back now. You know that he's Messiah. Do you understand what the Christ means? People say Jesus Christ. And again, I, I, to me, that's the enemy stealing from us. Because they don't understand it's Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one. And what does the anointed one mean? You could only understand that if you go back to the second Samuel 7 and you see. So let's go back with me. The second Samuel 7, second Samuel chapter 7. So I'm proving to you just by, by a little way that Yeshua is God, very God, Emmanuel. This is a hill to die on. I speak to my Jewish brother. He is Emmanuel. He is the God of Israel in the flesh. He's also the son of David. So you've got to embrace both of that. So 2 Samuel 7, we have this revelation. Bear, bear with me, 2 Samuel 7. God, uh, David is, is being given a, a, a revelation from God through his, his, um, the prophet. And he's speaking that he wants to build a house for God. And, and, the, and Nathan, the prophet, they say, no, you want to build a house for God? God will build a house for you. You want to build something that's temporary? God is going to build something that is eternal. So verse 12, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up. Notice God is saying, I will do it. I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you. Come forth from you. And I will establish his kingdom. Of course, you could think Solomon. You're right. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom when? Forever. Now you're getting an eternal perspective. So this is not just speaking about Solomon. This is speaking about the greater son of David, the greater son of Solomon. Are you seeing that under inspiration of the spirit? Then he adds, 
I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Oh my God, that's the father, that's the son from an eternal perspective. And then come down to the human level when he commits iniquity. Well, you know now that's not speaking about Yeshua because Yeshua was tempted in all points and without sin. So this is not speaking back to Solomon. You've got to be literate and literal. You've got to understand what's, what is taking place. The tension, right? I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. All right, and that's exactly what happened on the cross, where Yeshua, who knew no uh, un, uh, um, right, uh, knew no unrighteousness, became a, 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 a sin offering for us, so that we may inherit the righteousness of God. In His humanity, He died and suffered the rod of men, the strokes of the Son of Man. Are you seeing it now? I'm going back and forth on the text. I'm hoping that you've seen it, right? Okay. And verse 15. But my love and kindness, my chesed, shall not depart from Him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house, watch this. Your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. That's the eternal. You see that? I'm seeing here a kingdom, a house, a throne. And which one is that? Yeshua, when the angel came, Gabriel to Miriam, she said, listen, you're going to have a son. He's going to be son of the highest. And God will give him to rule over the throne of David. Why? Because the Messiah is a descendant of David, ruling over Israel, but not just over Israel, over the whole world, because he's more than this, the Jewish Messiah. He's the Jewish Messiah God. I'm saying Jewish Messiah God so that you could see that the Messiah is Jewish. That concept of Messiah comes out of Judaism. So he's the Jewish Messiah God. All of that in one. And to diminish any of them is to have an incomplete understanding of who Messiah is. And so I'm believing this point to show us again that Yeshua is the Messiah. The, the prophets speak about it again and again. This, the, the, he is the, he, the shoot of Jesse and he's also the root of Jesse. He springs forth from Jesse, but he also causes Jesse to come into existence. Are you understanding that tension that he's both root and shoot? He springs from David, but he's also the one who gave David life in the first place because he is in another realm. You've got to understand all of that. And so today we have Judaism and Islam stumbling over the deity of the Messiah, stumbling over that. He's just a good teacher. All right. But you have Christianity stumbling over his Jewishness. And I, 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 I say, well, what is happening? But then I be, God began to open my eyes because I said, the scriptures cannot be broken. So he has to be. So Hebrews tell us that it is evident that our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. It is evident. That seems not to be evident to many people, but it is evident. He came from the tribe of Judah. All right. Baruch Hashem. But let's continue on. So I'm making that point because I want to see all of this is understanding Psalm 110. Eh? To understand Psalm 110, you've got to know. Let me go back again. The Lord said to my Lord, I want to read it again for us again because I'm hoping, oh God, in all our understanding, you know, in all, in all, all our getting, get understanding. Right? So verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, that first Lord there is what we call today because we don't know exactly how to pronounce, and even if we know, we wouldn't pronounce. It is yod heh vav -He, what the Jewish people call Adonai, or in common language, Hashem. So you could write in, Hashem says to my master. Hashem says to Adoni. Hashem says to my Adon. But we're making the point that that second Lord, my Adon, is deity. Because to none of the angels did he say, sit at my right hand. So you've got to wrestle with this text now. David is speaking on the inspiration of the Spirit. And he says, my son is my Lord. He's both my shoot and my root. Let me go to Revelation and see this. Go with me quickly to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I want to give us this. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I'm making this point. That he's the son of God. He's the son of David. Look at Revelation 22 verse 16. I, Yeshua, have sent my messenger to testify to these things for the congregation. The congregations in the day of, of John and the congregations today. Listen to what he says. I am the root. Notice the root. And the shoot, the descendant of David. The bright morning star. So you've got to receive this. He is the son of God. He is the son of David. And Rav Shaul made a big point about that. According to the flesh, 
son of David. According to the resurrection, according to the spirit, son of God. Not either or both. And I tell you, brethren, you need to understand this. Now, bear with me as I bring this point home. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Because remember, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So I want us to see now. The enemies would resist this one who is called my master. They would resist him being enthroned as God's son, as the son of David. They will fight against that. And you and I have to be so aware, brethren, that this is what is taking place. It is spiritual warfare at its height in fighting against this revelation. But God has given it to us. I want you to go with the book of Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And I want us to look at this word, chapter 6, verse 10. Verse 10 says, Finally, finally, the Spirit breathes this word through the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul. Finally, finally, what do you mean finally? Well, I've been giving you a discourse and I'm coming to the end. So I want you to make a Kesha to what I just said before and what I'm going to say now. Many people read Ephesians 6 and they just think about the armor of God. That's all they have, the armor of God. But they don't connect it to what went before. So they don't see no connection to the armor of God and what Rav Shaul was discussing on before. And they don't understand. Finally, okay, I'm coming to the end of it. So, okay, I'm just wrapping up and just giving you this. No, what is coming after this finally is very much, is very significant to what I was speaking to about before. So look at it, verse 6. He said, finally, be strong in the Lord. You got to hear Moses. You got to think, think, think Jewishly, think Hebrew, think the Torah. You got to hear Moses on his last day say, "Be strong and courageous." Why? Because he knows that Israel is going to have to engage in spiritual battle to conquer the land. And so here you have Moses, who is alive, speaking through Rav Shaul. Finally, be strong in the Lord, because you are going to face some battles—not physical battles necessarily, spiritual battles. And just as Israel needed to be strong and very courageous, you're going to be needed to be strong and very courageous. That's what he's telling us: be strong. And that word "be strong" means it, it is saying it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. It is be strong. I'm commanding you to be strong. And it's a, a, a it's an imperative, passive presence. Why? Why is that? So why is that important to me? Imperative means it's a command. Present means God says be strong right now. And passive means that is ongoing. It's continuous. So every time you're going to engage in spiritual warfare, you need to be strong. You need to have a supernatural strength. You need to have the power of God filling your mind. Because to do this battle, you can't just go as a weakling. You got to be strong. You got to be filled with the power of God. And you got to be able to be strong and very courageous. Because to enter into the kingdom is much tribulation. Look what Paul went through. Misunderstood, ridiculed, stoned, all these things. And he had to be strong and very courageous. Because if you're not, you would run away at the first opposition you have. No. Like human, you may draw back a little. But God pulls you. He propels you forward. Because it's not by your strength. Be strong in the Lord. Draw your strength from him. You are in him. You are rubbing shoulder with supernatural power. Draw strength from him because the battle is intense. And you need to understand why this battle is so intense. So be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Do you understand that phrase? The strength of his might? You want to make his enemies his footstool? You only have to be there if you are strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Well, the strength of his might goes back to Ephesians 1. When he was speaking about the resurrection. Go back with me to Ephesians 1. Let me just show us this. Oh my God, Father, help us. Give us strength and stamina. So in in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, and what is the passing greatness of his power towards us believe, those in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. That's the same expression in Ephesians 6, 10, which he brought about in Messiah when he raised him, raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. You see, oh my God. The, The Greek reveals to us this is resurrection power this is as god cranking up his power he displayed his power in, in saying let there be and the universe came into existence 
But this is saying to us, listen, when I allow that Kratos power, that supernatural dynamis power to invade that tomb where my son was, death could no longer hold him. The Kratos power of God began to infuse every cell, every tissue of the dead body of Yeshua and life, life more abundantly was coming into it. That power was so great that it, it removed the stone. It, 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 it caused the, the, the soulless to be knocked out. This was irresistible power that is coming, right? And when he's resurrected now, God is saying to us, oh my God, he's sitting at his right hand, but I want you to see the battle. Oh my God, use your imagination. He is resurrected and he's now beginning to ascend. And as beginning to ascend, all of hell, principalities, powers and rulers of darkness are trying to prevent him from ascending. He is going up. I want you to get the picture. He is ascending, but they don't want him to ascend. So they're trying to keep him down. And as they're trying to keep him down, God is what cranking up his power and raising him through the heavens, making a spoil of principalities and powers, throwing them off and causing his son to arise to his right hand. God is saying that the strength of his might that's resurrection power. And that power, beloved, is available to you and I. If we would obey the command to, to be being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that command is there for us to be filled. So go back with me to Ephesians 1. Are you, getting to, are you beginning to understand what God is saying to us? Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now remember, context is everything, brethren. When you go back to Ephesians, he's telling you, be strong, be filled. In the Lord, you have to be always in the Lord. If you're not in the Lord, this is not going to happen. If you decide to have an excursion in the flesh, you can, you can be binding right, left, and center, rebuking. It's not going to happen because if you're not in the Lord, no power is coming to you. That power is only available to those who are in the Lord and remain in the Lord, drawing strength from him because it's not our strength. It is his strength. That same power that tried to prevent him from re resurrecting is the same power that is contending with us today. All right? So be strong in the Lord. But I want you to think about something. Paul the Apostle is writing to who? The Ephesians. you got to go back to the book of Acts and see this. Oh, my God. In the book of Acts, chapter 19, if you go back, you would see that Paul went into Ephesus. And God, by his grace, was, 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 was opening and bringing out the Gentiles from Ephesus into the kingdom of God. And I want you to remember, can I remind you what happened? There was a riot. There was an uproar. Why was that happening? Because Demetrius would have put forward this argument that they are telling us that these gods are no gods. And they put forward an argument that Artemis, Diana, who was, who, who was a great fallen from the heaven, she is, a, 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 is like the queen of Asia. And you should know that. But something was happening that I want you to see. Oh, my God. This is real conflict here, brethren. There was something that was happening. There was a defection that was happening. What is defection? Gentiles, pagan, Ephesian Gentiles who would visit the temple of Artemis in, in idolatry and in immora immorality, prostitution, are now losing loved ones. <laughs> There's a defection that's happening. Are you seeing? I want you to take up, oh my God, open our eyes to see this thing, Lord. Fill us with your spirit that we can be strong to understand what's happening there. So there's a defection. And the principality over Ephesus was now stirring up the kings over Ephesus to work in the minds of Demetrius and the other people to attack. So this riot that was made visible was really stirred up in the heavenlies. Are you understand what's happening here now? Because he's saying, now be strong because this is what's happening. And it caused the whole uh, 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 um, people to turn against the Jewish people. They wanted to kill them. Where is that illogical, irrational hatred coming from? Why? We're going to see as we go forward. Okay? You see, many people would have read Ephesians 6. And if you come from an evangelical background, you may be so familiar with this. But because you're so familiar with it, it's a stumbling block because you're unable to see it from the Jewish perspective. And you're thinking that this is not connected to anything before. But I tell you, with Paul, everything is connected. It's not just a collection of random thoughts. No, there is an eternal consistent connection to Rav Shaul. So when you understand Rav Shaul's message, you will understand what he is alluding to, what he's saying as he's giving this letter. And what was Paul's message? Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. What was he proclaiming? 
Gentiles, you can come into the kingdom of God, into the commonwealth of Israel as Gentiles. You don't need to convert to become a Jew to come into the kingdom. You can come into the kingdom, all right, and remain as a Gentile. And that caused no, no small stir because the Jewish mind said, no, you have to convert to become part of the kingdom. And Paul said, no, God is able to save a Jew as a Jew and a Gentile as a Gentile. So look what's happening here. The, 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 the ruler over Ephesus was beginning to lose ground. Go with me to the book of Luke. I want you to see this. In the book of Luke, chapter 11. Luke, chapter 11. And I want to pick it up from verse 21. Luke, chapter 11. I want you to get a picture. You see, the Messiah gave us these things. I want to give us this picture, right? Luke, chapter 11, verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. This is what is happening here in Acts chapter 19. This is what's happening here in Ephesus. This is what's happening to you and I right now. I want you to see Paul's theology was about bringing out from the nations a people called by his name, Gentiles called by his name. But I want you to understand, think Hebraically, what God did in bringing Israel out of Egypt was being repeated again and again with every Gentile that was coming out from under the dominion of Hasatan. This is what was being played out. Oh my God, Father, help us to see it. And he said, I don't want you, oh my God, I don't want you to be, to be ignorant of the wilds of the devil. Go back with me and see something. Father, we, we, we're getting there, we, we, we're coming home to it, but I want you to see something. In Ephesians chapter uh, um. Uh, yeah, in verse 10, he said, put on the whole arm of God to stand against the schemes of the devil. Be strong to stand against. What are the schemes of the devil? Well, that word schemes take us back to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more crafty. He was scheming. He was cunning. He was deceptive. He was deceiving. So the schemes deal with, 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 with that, 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 that scheming to deceive, to seduce, to turn your way. He said, be mindful of it. Because the schemer is coming to scheme you. But I want to submit something to us, brethren, that I want us to, to see, oh, by, 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 by God's grace. Oh, my God. Look at this. Oh, my God. Go with me to 2 Corinthians uh, 12. Yes. And then I'm going go to make this point. 2 Corinthians, not 12, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to pick it up from verse 10. 